um, let me. Let me okay, good, got it. Um, so let me let me share the screen. Um, uh, where are we? Let's start from here. And I'm going to check that you can all hear me and see me. Um, oh, sorry, wrong slide there. Let's actually start from the beginning. Okay, so that's that's brilliant. Um, let's see how we've got. We've got a, people are people are joining as we as 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 we go on. So. Um, if we're if we're ready to start, I um I'll say first of all, um, apologies to those who um who were expecting to to, to see someone else. Um, Catherine had to pull out at, at, at the last minute today. She's not well. We're hoping to reschedule that one for for next week, right? And um, and I'll, you know, although this seminar series is 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 based around uh, active tectonic studies, um. Of the of the Central Asian region, and the important part of it, um, this is something I'm going to try and get across to you this uh, month, is the understanding of landscape evolution. And so, if we can understand landscape evolution, how past climates, environments have affected the ways in which those landscapes have developed, then it, it gives us a real kind of you know insider, you know, a, a big way into understanding the the the, the tectonic forcings of, of, of those landscapes. Which are often, in some ways, the, the kind of smaller uh, component of what we see. And yeah, I'm giving this talk. This is actually something that I've cobbled together from from various other presentations I've given over the last um, uh, couple of years. Um, and this is work that we're doing um, primarily in Turkmenistan. So within this lecture, you're going to get an opportunity to see some some. Some rare photographs from the field, um, work that myself, Christoph, a few students in Oxford have been doing in collaboration with the uh, National Academy of Sciences um, in, um, in, 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 in Turkmenistan. Um, also a point that we are starting new collaborations in Azerbaijan, uh, looking at the whole South Caspian region. I hope I'm going to convince you there's lots to learn in this area, and this is something that we're trying to widen and we'll be doing so over the over the coming years. Um, the bulk of this work is actually, um, well, a, a lot of it was started off through a consortium Earthquakes Without Frontiers listed at the bottom of this of this slide here, and also Comet, the Comet Center in the UK. Uh, primarily, this is being brought forward at, uh, at the present uh, through a through funding we have through the Leave Union Trust, and, uh, and I'll, I'll describe that to you as well. So this is the Leave Union Trust project. It gives me an opportunity to, to advertise that to you. This is a project um, with a rather grand acronym, EROICA, um, and it actually comes very naturally from the a long title, The Earthquake Ruptures of Iran and Central Asia. So this is a study that's got a, quite a broad remit. Um, in the past, we've been talking to you about the Tian Shan, and we have a project funded through NATO SPS looking at um, environmental hazards in the Tian Shan region. Um, this Leave Your Human Trust project is somewhat partnered with that, um, with that NATO effort, but it's got a much broader remit, right? And it's focused very particularly on looking at earthquake ruptures. The idea being that large intraplate earthquakes are rare. There's a limited database of modern examples to draw on when we're trying to understand the variability of earthquake ruptures that might occur in the near future. Uh, but across Central Asia, we have some things we can draw on. First of all, we have a large database of early to mid 20th century earthquakes, an important database of rupture in large magnitude earthquakes. So there's, there's, there's many examples. I'm going to show you a slide in a little while, which, which really can help us to learn something more in terms of um, you know, what may occur in, in, in future. They also, because of this timing, early mid 20th century, we can combine a number of different techniques. We can combine remote sensing, field investigation, seismology, heritage, remote sensing, imagery, aerial photos, these kind of things. And we can use, so we can treat them in some ways as modern events. Um, but we can also treat them as, as historical events. Right? So they bridge that gap between historical records and, 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 and modern records, and they allow us to give calibration 
going further back in time. So how do we understand and build quantified information into historical and paleo seismic records, right? So, so they're very important in, in, in those respects. Um, the final thing that we have within Central Asia, Iran and Central Asia, I use that term very loosely, basically anywhere within the interior of, of the Asian continent, is that we have a landscape that is ideal for retaining evidence of old earthquake ruptures, spanning time periods of a thousand years or greater. So we can generate very large data sets covering sufficiently long periods to capture the variability of rupture in continental interior settings. And, and for that, we, we, we would say both the historic and prehistoric uh, periods and in different parts of Asia, what could be historic for one part of Asia might be prehistoric for another. So we can, we can kind of learn uh, and bring um, value from studies in one area and, 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 and to, to, to pull those into, into other areas as well. It's worthwhile reminding ourselves of the um, societal importance of these kind of studies. This is uh, some plots that were uh, well, really from, from Philip England, James Jacks, at a paper they published in 2011, um, Uncharted uh, Seismic Risk, um, were used without throughout the uh, Earthquakes Without Frontiers project. So in the map, we have um, earthquakes plotted by the amount of, of, of casualties, deaths caused by them. Um, you can see that many of the most destructive events have been within the interior of, of Asia. If we look at the size of earthquakes that have caused those, um, um, those disasters, we see that many of them are actually not the largest, right? So that in terms of magnitude, we're looking, uh, you know, seven, seven and a half. Um, we, we, we can see that also in, in terms of the histogram at the, at the bottom, where if we look at total cumulative deaths per, per magnitude, um, we see that the, the most destructive in terms of cumulative death tolls have been in the magnitude 7.5, with, with 13 events causing a, a cumulative half a million uh, deaths, also at magnitude 7, uh, with 18 events causing some, something similar. Um, the, the very largest earthquakes, often associated with subduction zone, like boundary events, often associated with, with large scale uh, tsunami uh, damage as well, are rare, they are destructive, but, but cumulatively these plate interior events have, have, have been um, uh, devastating. We see a trend of increasing earthquake fatalities as we go through time. Um, so this is in centuries from a thousand years ago to, to present day. Um, before the Industrial Revolution, we were seeing one um, earthquake disaster about once every 20 years in terms of, you know, ones that, that killed more than 10,000 people. This rose to one every five years. In the 20th century, it was even more common. And we're on track to, to be seeing even even more than that as we go. This is basically, it's not, you know, this is um, a symptom of increased urbanization, increased population, um, places that were small in the past that are now become large cities. We have not had those large cities around long enough to be, to, 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 to see um, the, the, um, the large populations in the historical record, but we are seeing these places to, starting to be damaged badly by earthquakes. Um, we've been doing, yeah, this is kind of an advertisement for some of the things that we've done, some of the things that we're doing, um, span the interior of Asia. Um, this map shows a lot of the, 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 the record of these you know, late 19th century, early 20th century earthquakes. Uh, there's a bunch in Kyrgyzstan, and these form quite a, a bulk of, of, of this NATO project, the, the thing that we've been organizing these lectures through. Um, there is the, you know, Verney earthquake, uh, Belabods, Chile, uh, Chongkamin, really large earthquakes, apparently clustered in time and space. There's lots that we can learn from them. Similarly, within Tajikistan, uh, Karatau, Haidt, Sarez earthquakes, uh, and also an important set of earthquakes that have occurred in um, Turkmenistan, um, 1948 earthquake um, in Ashgabat, which was devastating, 1895 Krasnovodsk. Um, so there's large amounts of these. We're also doing similar work in, in, in trying to understand or, or, or reinvestigate some of the early 
instrumental earthquakes of China, 1920, Haiwan, um, which was a, uh, a recent published paper by Chi Yu and et al. Um, in Journal of Geophysical Research, also the Changma earthquake in Gansu. And we're doing some work in Iran. Uh, we continue to look at the, the, the sequence of earthquakes in Desh Tabayaz that occurred in uh, the 60s and 70s, also the, 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 the Tabas earthquake that occurred in 1978. So lots of those things going on. This is just to give you an example, a few examples of some of those. So, so in China, the Haiwan earthquake 1920, uh, Yu's paper. Um, also looking uh, further back into history in China, there is a long historical record. And what we've been trying to do is to gain more geological information about the types of earthquakes that may um, uh, have caused those historical uh, events. This one is from Yinchuan, uh, 1739. You can still see the ruptures preserved at the ground surface. Here you see the nice wedge material in the downflip side, a nice normal port here with uh, I think about three meters of displacement in, in this case. A lot of this landscape, by the way, has been uh, significantly modified in the few years since we did that research. Um, if we go to the Tianshan earthquake, such as the 1889 Chilik earthquake, very large earthquake magnitude uh, eight uh, plus, you can see the people here on the scarf or scale, it's about 10 meters of displacement in, in what appears to be a single event. And here is a photo from uh, the 1911 uh, Chongqing um, um, Chonaxu ruptures um, in, in Kyrgyzstan, forces for scale. This was published in Bogdanovich's 1914 study. These are places, these ones in the Tian Shan are ones that we're focusing on within our present NATO grant. Um, what I would like to talk to you today, though, are places much further to the west. Uh, I would, this, by, by doing this talk, I, I kind of go back to places that I have been looking at since the days of my PhD. Um, my first visit to Iran was in 2000 when I was a PhD student in, in Cambridge University. This is me um, in my early 20s uh, by the citadel of Bam in, in, in southeast Iran. This was actually just a few years before this, this whole area was, was, was very badly damaged by a destructive earthquake. Um, and I've kind of, you know, this, this whole area, Iran and the surroundings of Iran, are important as a, as a natural laboratory for early stage continental collision. And we continue to learn things about how continental collisions evolve and change through time, how the active fault systems uh, evolve and change through time within them. So this is kind of one reason that I've I continue to go back to these areas and have very long running uh, programs. The earthquakes that occur within the Iran um, region, or the, I guess more correctly, the Arabia Eurasia Continental Collision Zone, give insight into earthquake and active fault processes. Earthquakes are common. Um, many of the active faults are moving quite rapidly. Um, there is a long historical record. There's all sorts of ways in which we can get into the earthquake problem within this region. Um, the other thing, and this is, you know, I want to just kind of link through to, to, to you know, Catherine was going to be talking about paleo-environmental um, um, studies within the Central Asian region. Uh, across Western parts of Central Asia, there's a lot of environmental challenges. It's, very, it's an area that's very arid, it's susceptible to climatic changes, it's susceptible, oh well actually there's a lot of evidence for landscape evolution that we can use to try and, and, and get insight into how those climatic changes may have affected the environment. It's an area where water resources are really a, 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 you know, a first order issue and again if we're studying the landscape from the point of view of active tectonics we can learn a lot also about the, um, the potential for uh, past changes in climate, past changes in precipitation, and changes in, in, in water resources through, through time. So, you know, that's kind of the motivation to working in, in a place like Iran. Um, the, the, the other thing is, of course, the, 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 the societal challenges that, that, that earthquakes pose in such an area. Uh, this is a, um, an oblique view um, made from satellite imagery dra uh, draped over a um, uh, digital elevation model of Tehran, the capital city of Iran. It's actually a part of, of Tehran. Um, the edges go off this, uh, you know, this view. There's a scale at the bottom that's approximately 10 kilometers on the side there. And you can see the straight plan of the city everywhere within there. 
There are active faults known even within the interior of the city, right? This is the partisan um, uh, blind thrust, uh, right? Probably the, you see folding at the surface, you, you don't really see the, the main thrust itself. To the north of the, of the city, you've got the, uh, the North Tehran Fault. We know that there have been earthquakes in the Tehran region, 855 AD, 958, 1177, 1830. That was a long historical record of earthquakes. This helps us to interpret the geology, where, you know, not just myself, but various um, teams have been trying to figure out the um, uh, history of past earthquakes in, in, in various parts of the Tehran region, and to also understand uh, from the landscape how um, active faults uh, or where the active faults are, how rapidly they're moving, etc. Um, but the difference is that all of those historical earthquakes occurred when Tehran was a small town. In fact, if you look at what Tehran was like in 1947, this was a, the approximate footprint of, of Tehran at that time. It's only expanded into the mega city that it is today in the, in the last few decades. Right? And so all of these historical earthquakes that we see here are earthquakes that affected a small center. Now we have a city of 10, 15 million people built up over this, right? And, and Tehran is I mean, it's not the only example in this way. This is a, something that we see across the interior of Asia, that as small towns have built up into large cities, they're doing so in areas of relatively unconstrained earthquake hazard. And so therefore, we have a challenge um, right now to try and build in knowledge of those geological hazards to keep pace with the with the development of the centers themselves i you know if, if we can do this quickly we can actually hopefully try and make a difference in terms of, of, of knowledge of the hazards that can build eventually into uh, reducing the risk and vulnerability of populations the other thing that we can do by learning about the geology of earthquakes in areas with long um, um, uh, historical records is that we can use that to extend the short historical region um, record in other regions. So we can take the lessons we learn from a place like Tehran or, or elsewhere in Iran, and we can apply it to, to other parts of Central Asia uh, with, 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 with shorter historical records, right? So by looking in many different places simultaneously, we, we build up a, um, an overall, a, a more continuous um, or, 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 or better appreciation. Earthquakes. We said that the Arabia-Eurasia collision is important uh, in terms of the study of earthquakes. We've listed some of the reasons why that is. They happen quite regularly. There's a long historical record. Um, also, they, they can have very bad effects in terms of, of, of societal um, uh, you know, damage to populations, uh, loss of life. Here on the left-hand side, we have a compilation. This is from a paper by James Jackson um, in 2007. We have two colors of dots. Recent earthquakes, instrumentally recorded earthquakes in the last 50 years or so. Red represent earthquakes that have occurred over historical times. Historical times obviously vary from place to place. There are records of earthquakes in Iran stretching back several thousands of years, but obviously that is not complete. Um, you can see that the two um, data sets complement each other. Some places you see earthquakes in similar areas, some places you can see uh, a lot more in terms of historical earthquakes than, than is represented in present days, right? So simultaneous study of those two different time periods can be helpful to get a more holistic view of earthquake hazard. Also, when we look at um, uh, destructive events here, white dots are those that have killed more than 10,000 people. Um, red dots, those that have killed more than 30,000 people in this case, and we see a widespread hazard between them. Um, this is just a picture from, from uh, actually a picture taken by Nick Ambrose's um, in the aftermath of the 1968 Dash Dubai's earthquake, which is this white dot here, which was a devastating earthquake. These are actually secondary um, um, uh, cracks within a, within a uh, dry lake bed. Uh, here, this is a destroyed village in the background, um, uh, and um, this is an area that we we, you know, we continue to 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 to, to learn about um, clustered um, strike slip uh, faulting earthquakes. Even um, there's still lots that we can find from these regions. 
but we have other types of, of, of technologies and, and studies that have um, that have developed over the past decades and that help us to learn more about this this continental collision and the earthquakes and faults that occur within them. One is GPS. Uh, so the study of the, the strain accumulation across various parts of the, of the country using GPS, excuse me, I, I, yes, I hope you can still see me. Uh, my, um, I'm having a bit of an issue with my screen. Hopefully, Christoph, maybe you can tell me if things are still okay with you. Everything okay? Yeah, everything's okay. fine. Okay, good. Um, so we have GPS velocities um, that have been produced through a number of different surveys since about 2004 through to the present day, such that we can go from you know, what was known in terms of uh, GPS uh, or you know, strain accumulation within Iran in, in the early 2000s, nothing, uh, through to what we know now, and we, we have a really uh, nice uh, advanced view. We are slowly adding into that into seismic strain accumulation studies from, from INSAR as well. Um, and, and, and these have been focused into, into individual regions within there. They're not shown on this picture, but they are nonetheless important. At the same time, we've seen a lot of, of, of field-based studies of, of, of geomorphic slip rates, trying to look at what the major faults are doing, how rapidly they're moving, what types of earthquakes that, that might have occurred on them, paleoseismic studies as well. This is non, uh, not exhaustive, uh, and in fact, not up to date either, right? Um, stops in 2016, but you know, in a number of different studies by a number of different teams, a number of different collaborations. We, we've gone from a point that in 2003, we knew that nothing to a point in 2019, or there's a few more recent papers since then, we have a good appreciation across the, um, across the country of, of what the, the, the major faults are doing on a, on, a, on a longer time scale. And we can now, we, we're at a point where we can take those two sets of data and we can actually combine them, we can compare them to see how the present day accumulation of, 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 of strain um, compares with the long-term accumulation of slip on uh, faults. Um, two things we might ask ourselves from this are, first of all, whether measurements of present day into seismic strain are representative of long-term slip rates on the faults, or conversely, uh, we, whether we can use long-term fault slip rates to infer what's happening in the present day, right? So depending on whether your interest is in, in modeling the, um, the large-scale continental deformation or whether your uh, um, interests are using geological studies of faults to, to look at present day. Um, in many parts of Iran, the faults are too closely spaced to resolve with, with GPS. So what I'm going to show you here is, is really the restriction to a few very simple areas where you have one or, or a small number of major active faults um, that where we, we can get some idea of how the two uh, data sets might compare to one another. If we do that, oh, and no, this is just a repeat of what we had before. I'm going to show you examples, first of all, from Tabriz, secondly, from Darune in the northeast of Iran, and, and finally, from the uh, Ashgabat or, or main Kapet Dog fault of Turkmenistan, which is what brings us into, into Turkmenistan. Um, broadly, if we make these comparisons of short-term and long-term deformation across Iran, this is an example from uh, Megali Riza et al. 2013 from the Tabriz fault, we see close agreement. So here, looking at the short-term GPS gives 7.3 plus or minus 1.3 millimeters per year. INSAR gives uh, um, well, less well resolved rate, but six plus or minus three millimeters per year. If we look at geological rates, we get, and you know, here is um, you know, displaced alluvial fan displaced by about 320 meters. It's offset here. Um, ages from um, uh, luminescence dating gives slip rates in the range of 6.5 to 7.3 millimeters per year. So, so broadly agreeing, we see the same in in many studies across Iran, not everywhere. There's a few places where there have been differences um, that have been noted. One of which is the Darune fault in, 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 in Northeast Iran's big left lateral strike slip fault. This is actually quite noticeable in, in, in terms of the, the, the lack of earthquakes that have occurred on the Darune fault. It's a place that uh, there's very little 
Um, there are some records of earthquakes, um, but that's the, the main part of the, the fault has not produced large um, earthquakes in, in history or um, in recent times that are known about. And if we take the Daruno faults, and what we've done, been doing over the past few years, as a paper just published um, by Musavi et al. In, uh, in tectonics, is by looking at a number of different catchments, dating the alluvial fans, river terraces that, that flank those, um, those catchments, and which are displaced by various amounts of, of, of time and by different amounts of displacement, we can make comparisons to see whether this fault is likely to uh, agree with what we see at the present day and whether it has a constant slip rate through time. This is what we tried to do. We have taken um, examples with displacements that vary from kind of 25 meters, you know, displacements of these streams here, of these rises between T1 and T2 here, combined with ages of, of, of materials of those terraces here giving something in the uh, in the early Holocene, nine, uh, 10,000 years, um, and getting from there slip rates in, in these kind of um, amounts, you know, 1.7, 4.1 millimeters per year, a, a larger estimate based upon um, um, restoration of the offset of this, of this higher level, which we call F2 of 200 meters or so, uh, giving something similar number of other catchments, again, this one, uh, which we call Site B, Nazirabad, where we have ages on the surfaces, we have displacements of the surfaces, 190 meters in this case, and allows us to give um, a long-term um, uh, slip rate for that fault as well. Those kind of amounts we were getting, you know, one to four millimeters per year or, or, or so, um, are compatible with what we think the faults are doing in this area, right? So uh, central Iran is being is being squashed by Arabia, right? You have north-south shortening within central Iran. You have fewer or, or, or very little earthquakes, very little in terms of um, or, or, or much lower rate active deformation within these western parts of, of Afghanistan. And so it introduces a, a right lateral shear across um, eastern Iran. And our left lateral faults up here in the, in the corner are likely to accommodate that, that, um, that left lateral shear. And if they do so, then, you know, the kind of, uh, this kind of bookshelf faulting type, type model, the rates that we would expect, given the dimensions of those faults, are somewhat equivalent to what we, we, we measure uh, through our field studies. And if we plot up the displacement and the age of all of those different experiments ranging from 10,000 year in age up to about 100,000 years in age here. We can see, I mean, obviously it's not perfect. Some of these lie um, kind of slightly off the line, but they're nonetheless consistent with a slip rate of 2.6 plus or minus 0.2 millimeters per year, right? If we you know, fit a slip rate to all of those values, obviously different values are possible within uh, individual sites, but the, everything as a whole is consistent with, with, with that. So, you know, compatible with the constant slip rates is 100,000 years. That's also um, agrees with, with INSAR, existing INSAR constraint, which is that there is no observable signal, which tells us that within the level of noise, the strain accumulation is likely to be three millimeters per year or less. Um, and if we think in terms of the age of these, these, these sites that we've looked at, these old alluvial fans, river terraces, et cetera. It, it also starts to allow us to ask another question, um, which is, can we use these landscape features from the dating that we've done to, to actually start to, to, to build a quaternary stratigraphy? And this is where we start to get into the paleoenvironmental parts of the, the story. Um, and here, you know, we see 10,000 years, we see something a bit over 20,000 years, we see a lot of things happening at this age range, 50, 60, and then we see something happening at 100,000 years. Again, right? um, are those things responding to paleo environmental signals? Are they things that we can correlate over large areas? Are they part of a, of a, of a correlatable quaternary stratigraphy? Right? Can we use these kind of studies to build a Pleistocene stratigraphy for the region? And what we'll find is that Turkmenistan 
is, is, is a place where I'm hopeful that we can actually start to get into that, right? So again, Turkmenistan uh, is, is, is a place that's gonna be quite key for it. We, this has been something that's been of long-term interest to me uh, and various of my colleagues. And in fact, we tried to do this quite a long time ago, well, 10 years ago, we, we took all of the um, existing dated landscape features, which focused at the Holocene in, at that time, um, or the near Holocene, to try and build a, a you know a consistent uh, paleo environmental scenario that would explain the ages that we we're getting, and and it seemed to us that what we were seeing was a lot of fan deposition in the in the late glacial period, cold, arid, high sediment supply. We saw um, those alluvial fan depositions continue uh, through into the early Holocene, thirteen to nine thousand years. But also we started to see uh, lake basin formation, uh, uh, the filling of lake basins at that time. So presumably there was an increased rainfall, but combined with the high sediment supply that maintained the deposition of the range from fans. From then, nine to 7,000 years, we saw the lakes continuing to fill. Um, so we, we saw um, uh, the, the deposition of widespread lake uh, bed sediments um, but we saw less sediment supply. We, by that point, we were seeing incision of the range front alluvial fans, deposition instead in the basin interiors and widespread incision of the, of the older landscape features. And then we didn't really see much to date from about 5,000 years to present. Right? It seems as though a lot of that change was happening in the early part of the Holocene and that very little has then occurred um, in, in the later part, which we inferred to mean um, an increase in aridity. aridity. Um, the lakes seem to now be dry. Um, the landscape seems to be, have been somewhat stable since that time. And, and so, you know, that's as far as we got. But one of the things that we said at that time is, of course, you know, we should try and get more studies within Iran and surroundings that can help us to, to, to put meat on that, that framework of, 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 of environmental change. Also, what would be good is to go further back in time. Um, to, to go back beyond uh, the, uh, the, the, the Holocene and to go back into 100,000 year time scales um, to get a much better idea of how the, uh, the climates and the environments may have, may have changed over those periods and how they may have influenced the, the landscape development that we see. Um, this is challenging because as you go further back in time, um, the dating uh, becomes more challenging as well. You get larger uncertainties. There are fewer places where you can get really nice um, um, you know, sequences uh, that are, that are um, well preserved and which we can get to. Again, Turkmenistan turns out to be quite key in terms of this. And, and, and you know, this, all of these things bring us to Turkmenistan, right? All of these different strands are bringing us there right now. If we return to our map of, of earthquake locations across the country or across the entire Arabia Eurasia collision zone, we see widespread earthquakes, but there are some gaps. One of the questions that we can ask ourselves in earthquake studies are, are there, those gaps real? Um, or um, are they reflecting um, gaps within the earthquake record? One of the really significant gaps that we see is here in Turkmenistan. You see the edge of the, what are called the Copper Dog Mountains, right? There's a very straight edge to them. This is actually a big active fault, the main Copper Dog Fault. I'll show it to you. It's clearly an active fault. And yet we have nothing in recent times, we have nothing in the historical records along that central part. Right, so it allows us a bit of a test of, of to what extent we can, we can rely on historical records being complete. And obviously that's going to vary in different parts of the country, or different parts of the Arabia Eurasia collision zone, but it's a test that we can put in, in that place. Studies of these faults within Turkmenistan are also useful for looking at the regional tectonics, right? So, so here, this is you know, the border of, of Turkmenistan, Iran is, is shown by this black line. The faults in Turkmenistan, right, the Ashgabat fault, or what we really usually call the main Kopet Dog fault along here, works together with these big um, left lateral faults of the, of the Alborz Mountains to accommodate motion, Caspian 
basin, now the South Caspian Basin, relative to its surroundings, relative to Iran, relative to Eurasia. The South Caspian Basin seems to be some kind of, it's not a typical, it's not a, you know, a typical piece of continental uh, material, uh, even though it's uh, deep within Asia, it seems to be some kind of, 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 of maybe some kind of back arc or, 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 or remnant ocean basin uh, that formed in the Mesozoic times and, and remains there in, a, um, in the middle of, of, of Asia. So, and, and is actually moving independently of its surroundings. So these two big fault zones, right lateral faulting in Turkmenistan, left lateral faulting in the Eastern Albors, help to accommodate that motion of, 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 the, of the South Caspian Basin, that relative motion of the South Caspian Basin, which seems to be somewhere off to the, 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 the Northwest. It's a little bit like you can think of it as being like the motion of, of Turkey being accommodated by the East Anatolian and North Anatolian faults. But you know, here you've got these, these two right lateral and, and, and left lateral faults in, in Turkmenistan and, and Eastern Iran. So in terms of regional tectonics, we've got a couple of questions we can ask ourselves. How fast is the motion? What direction? How long has it been sustained? Um, and finally, we can look at earthquakes, um, the earthquake hazard. These are long faults, uh, very long strike slip faults, potentially moving quite rapidly. Um, and so they may be able to produce large magnitude earthquakes. Uh, the only thing that we have here, there is a potential earthquake in 856 AD, the Shari Kumis earthquake or Damgan earthquake, which is supposedly devastating uh, with, uh, with an apparent death toll of something like a quarter of a million people uh, with a damage zone extending for something like 250 uh, kilometers along this area. There was a large amount of, of, of um, uh, Silk Road trading centers um, along this area, high population density, which is uh, why there would have been such a large death toll here. Um, there's still some debate about that earthquake and exactly what happened in it and exactly what the death toll might have been. But, you know, this is, this is let's say, a contender for a large magnitude rupture along one of these conjugate fault systems. If we look at that Eastern Albors, uh, you know, the left lateral faults that run along the, the Albors mountains, we can try and figure out what the motion is on those faults using geodetic methods. We can use a GPS measurements, right? and you can actually see that as you cross these Eastern Albors, you see a big change in the direction of these velocity vectors representing um, the, the strike slip that is occurring between um, across the zone natural motion. You can also look at um, um, radar interferometry, right? so looking at interseismic strain accumulation uh, using two geometries of, of radar acquisition, both descending and ascending tracks, which you see in these two plots here. Um, because of the different geometries, the satellite is looking in different directions at both of these, so you, you see changes in, uh, you know, in the color scale between the two. Um, and but you, you can actually see here that across these strikes that faults there is quite a dramatic change in color. This is representing the chain the, the strain accumulation across the fault zone. There are some places we've messed out where there, where there's a lot of uh, noise, probably from water extraction. And these are the profiles taken through those um, those um, inside strain profiles. And then also with the GPS projected onto them, right? So, so that they're in the same uh, line of, of, of sight here. And you can see that uh, you have consistency between the GPS and the radar, and you can turn these line of sight velocities into a rate on the fault, assuming, uh, well, actually we get a similar rate on both the ascending descending tracks. This is telling us that it's likely to be predominantly lateral motion. There's not that much vertical motion. The slip rate agrees um, is somewhere between four to 5.5 millimeters per year. We get the same whether it's radar, GPS, or geology. There are some geological studies in, uh, in this area of four to seven millimeters per year. There are no historical earthquakes, so maybe that tells us, well, at least in this area that is black, right? You see the green. Um, this is the uh, big historical earthquake, 856 AD. There are no historical earthquakes for this part, right? So it tells us this is a priority. <laughs> looking at what is happening at present. Um, the INSAR 
um, attempts to look at the Ashka bed uh, fault gives a gives a range of values at bod wide six to twelve millimeters per year. Um, this should improve with with the with the new Sentinel satellites. I'll give you some little insights into that later on. Uh, the GPS, there is no GPS measurement in Menestan itself. And so you kind of have to project um, these velocities in Iran to tell you what <laughs> might happen. Uh, I think we need to um, just to turn off this ad in the news. Okay? Um, so, um, and so we have um, GPS that you project across there and it can get very different answers depending on um, what is, uh, you know, how, how you project it across. It can be anywhere from 7.5 millimeters per year to, to three millimeters per year. Um, so there's still a lot of things that we don't understand about that. What we have to try and do is then to measure the slip rate using field work and that's what we've been trying to do. So um, here we have um, the South Caspian region, the um, the, the, the cop, main copper dark fault on the northern side. We have the uh, eastern outpours. We're looking going to be looking at this part of the main copper dark fault. You have the um, the main fault running along here, the main strike slip fault. And this is pretty much pure strike slip faulting along here. There seems to be a partitioning, reverse faulting occurring on a separate fault, some five kilometers to the north. Um, and if we look in more detail at the, uh, uh, the geology around here, right? First of all, in the field, you can see lots of evidence for right lateral displacements at different scales, right? All of these stream displacements all the way along there. It's an amazing fault. Looking along it, you can see the fault trace is very, very clear. This is a slight kind of um, uh, releasing bend, I guess, along the fault here, producing this topography. In lots of places, it is, uh, it is pure strike slip or, or mostly pure strike slip. If you look at it in a satellite image, you can see evidence for large scale uh, right lateral displacement, right? So you can see, uh, well, the very clear one is this one here. And this is very clear because of the motorway running down it, right? But it is a, a, um, um, a displaced river valley with the amount here being something like 900 meters. There's a number of these which show similar amounts as we go along. We can go into the field. This is looking at that, an alluvial fan flanking that 900 meter uh, right lateral displacement. You dig pits into the surface. This is with our colleagues in the, um, in the uh, National Academy of Science in Turkmenistan. Um, we extracted samples for luminescence dating so just to show you a little bit more detail of that offset, right? So this is the 900 meter offset weight are looking at alluvial fans into which the, the river is cut. And if we try and, well, first of all, to try and measure the displacement in a little bit more detail, we have something like five streams on one side of the fault. We can match those up with five outlets on the other side. We can make separate measurements of displacement with minimum, maximum, best fit. We can you know, we've used that to try and get a, a best fitting offset, which is about 950 meters here. We take those displacements, we take the ages we get, the luminescence ages are about 100,000 years. We turn that into a slip rate of, of something like 9.1 plus or minus 1.3 millimeters per year. It's rapidly moving. There are very few, as we say, there were basically no earthquakes recorded upon this fault, but it's very rapidly moving. We can turn this into some um, improved knowledge of what's happening in terms of the regional tectonics. So we have the South Caspian Basin here. Um, this is a, a model that was produced by James Jackson in 2002. We know there's a bit of shortening, but mostly right lateral uh, motion across the uh, main covert dark fault here. We know that in the Alborz, there is left lateral faulting, which dies out at about this point. And so we might say that the South Caspian uh, Basin is moving orthogonal to the strike of the Alborz at that point. We know that Iran is moving northwards relative to Eurasia, so we can build a, a, a velocity triangle, right? With Iran, Eurasia motion down this northern side, Iran, South Caspian motion parallel to this arrow and Eurasia, Eurasia South Caspian, um, so um, South Caspian motion um, at some angle 
um, slightly oblique to the to the trend of the main COVID dark pool, and use that to to estimate what the numbers might be. What we can do now is we can take the GPS velocity field to directly uh, estimate the uh, Iran Eurasia motion. Right, so we take these places in in the more kind of stable parts of Central Asia. We get a rate of about 12 millimeters per year, pretty much north south. We can take our measurement on the main COVID dark fault, which is the pure strikes measure the shortening. We can take the measurements from, from uh, INSAR across the eastern Alborz and we have it across there as well. We know that there must be some unknown amounts of shortening orthogonal to those two strikes that faults represented by the uh, these, these pink areas and green areas and we can assign a motion to the Caspian interior of where everything overlaps right so we get some constraint indirectly on what the South Caspian Basin is doing the rates and the directions. And I'll note here that, that you know, Nick Dodds, a uh, student at Oxford University, has got somewhat similar results from, from new radar analysis. This is in review at the moment. It also prompts us to ask what is happening further to the west and just to give an advertisement that uh, where we, we are kind of building a collaboration right now with colleagues in the National Academy of Sciences in Azerbaijan to kind of address some of those questions. Finally, um, we should talk about earthquakes here, right? So um, in Turkmenistan, we don't have earthquakes or not, no significant earthquakes along the main part of the strike slip faults, but we do have earthquakes up in the um, Caspian lowlands, also closer to uh, Ashgabat, these kind of areas. Um, in Ashgabat, we have earthquake, the big earthquake in 1948, some evidence from, uh, from prehistory, archaeological remains in Nisa, the, the Parthian city of Nisa here, which actually uh, lies atop one of the main active fault strands, and also potentially from 2000 BC at a Bronze Age mound of Akadepe. We see a number of earthquakes in the uh, eastern Caspian area, Balkan and Bakunde, but nothing in between. Just to say the Ashgabat earthquake in 1948, the epicentral zone is somewhere around here. It's probably related to some mixture of strikes that faulting and reverse faulting. You can see this nice fold off to the south of, of Ashgabat. If we look at that part in the middle that has no record of, of, of major earthquakes, and this is a, a paper that's in revision at the moment, Nick Dodds and others, we see a very, very fresh expression of the fault. Right? So this is along that main strike slip fault. We see this very fresh scar running all the way along very continuous. We see a number of, of lateral deflections. This is a, an order of seven, eight meters here of, uh, of streams as we go along. Um, some of these can be quite astounding. Here is a, this is a, a worldview image of the, of the fault cutting through a small um, fan uh, with a number of, of, of streams cut into it. Each one is displaced by pretty consistent amounts, right? And it's, it's really quite fresh. Um, we also see evidence of the fault cutting through archaeological remains. So in this image, the fault goes right through the middle of this zone. Um, we can show that in a satellite image. We can find evidence of, 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 of agriculture, agricultural systems, field boundaries, which um, appear to be a medieval age. And if we look at those field boundaries where they cross the fault, we see that they're displaced by amounts, which are again, seven, eight meters. We can confirm that in the field. That's one of the field boundaries displaced by seven meters. You see it on the other side. And um, again, uh, these seem to be associated with, with, with medieval age um, uh, population centers. Um, there are other things that are displaced, right? So this part of the fault here, we see streams uh, displaced. We also see underground canal systems, these ganats, which appear to be displaced across the fault. We also see other small archaeological sites, this, 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 uh, you know, um, uh, this wall here, which seems to have about a five meter displacement in, in, in the wall. So this seems to be quite young, it seems to be displace a number of, of features in the landscape, also in archaeology. What Nick has done is he's uh, tried to put together all displacements he can find along the entire length of this and gets um, offsets of the, uh, an average offset across here of about seven to, to, to eight meters. We've also trenched it, right? There's a site here, there's a small scarp. We dug into this. It appears as though this occurred about 500, 700 years ago, uh, which we know from mega carbon. And so this is a major medieval earthquake that's missing from the 
historical record. Um, from the length of the ruptures, from the amounts of displacement, we might expect this to have been in the high magnitude 7, MW 7.8. Um, and from the um, slip rate that we get across this fault of so somewhat like nine millimeters per year, we might expect recurrence every 800 years or so. The cluster, the, the offset measurements that we find um, are apparently clustered along the um, along the length of this um, uh, main carpet dark fault. We see the five meter um, or, or order of uh, displacements, which we infer to be from a single earthquake. We see a lot that are around 60 meters, a lot at 150 meters, a lot of 350 meters, and a lot that are even larger, 900 meters, 950 meters, as I showed you earlier. And so what we can also start to do, and this is something that Nick did, but uh, you know, we're interested in, in, in furthering this, is to try and plot up all of these cumulative displacements. Uh, and we see the various peaks that we get. These are the, you know, this is the peak that we, we dated at being at about 100,000 years. And from this, with knowledge of the slip rate itself, right, because you know, in some ways this is pinned, we have a particular age on this, we can assign ages to the various large periods of alluvial band deposition. If that's the case, then 60 meters would be about six to seven and a half thousand years. 150 meters would be 15 to 18.7 thousand years, et cetera. And then the, this one out here would then be 130, 160, potentially um, correlating with the stage five, five E times. So we can use this kind of landscape um, record to, to, to kind of turn things on its back, right? And actually start to see what the, the, the stratigraphy what might be to assign ages to these various periods and then to move outwards and, 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 and to a more regional view of, to, to try and build this, this late quaternary stratigraphy. That's where we are with that right now. Um, but just to say that we are also attempting to, to, to combine that with direct paleoclimatic records. These are from, paleo, um, from speleothems. This was a, a, a project funded, initially funded by the Leafhume Trust. Uh, from various kind of cave records that we we have uh, from uh, from from a number of parts of, of Iran uh, using uranium series dating of um, stalagmite layers and also uh, various um, uh, trace element uh, and um, oxygen and carbon isotope um, uh, correlations to actually try and directly and and modeling actually of, of, of past climates to try and get the um, the, the direct um, aridity and, and, and paleo precipitation records. Um, that's it, right? I wanted to give you something that, that shows you kind of some of the things that we're doing, especially in Western parts of Central Asia and some of the justifications behind it. Also an idea of where we're going with the research. In conclusion from this talk, first of all, well, one thing is that in, in uh, Turkmenistan here, that these gaps in earthquakes are not necessarily meaning that they are actual real gaps, that we have uncovered one large medieval earthquake that ruptured the entire middle part of this major strike the fault system. It prompts us to ask questions, how complete are the earthquake catalogues? And also the potential for magnitudes to exceed what is known from instrumental records. That earthquake, if we're correct that it was high magnitude sevens, is the largest known from, from this entire area, right? So it prompts us to, to, to look for answers further back in time to uh, help understand present day levels of hazard. We found that the main carpet dark fault has a slip rate of, of nine millimeters per year or so. It's consistent with short-term geodetic rates and helps to constrain the motion tectonics of South Caspian Basin. This is something that will continue for a project that will continue for many years in the future. And we also see a broad regional correlation of landscape evolution. It gives a potential window into the paleoclimatic variability and also the potential here to start building late quaternary stratigraphy and the idea of, 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 of robust correlations of landscape features without the need for direct dating. Um, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, everyone. Great, thank you, Richard. So apologies for this short interruption <laughs> earlier. That's the, that's the first time that that's happened to me. I, yeah. I, so I feel it's a badge of honor, right? You know. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. So yeah, um, we are open for questions. Oh, there's already one question. Um, by Solmas. 
Richard, um, thanks for the great overview. How do you make sense out of the opposing kinematics between the mostly sinistro faults in eastern Iran and the dextral Herat fault in western Afghanistan and their implications for regional dynamics? Ah, thank you so much. And, and thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed the talk. Um, yeah, maybe I get, I, maybe I share my screen and share a map so that, that we can all, um, so that we can all um, see, see this. Um, oh, excuse me, sorry, I, I did, made a bit of a mistake. So let's find you a map of Iran. Now, maybe this one. Yeah, okay, right. So, so here we've got a lot of left lateral um, faulting running through the northeast of Iran, which is actually quite close to and in line with um, faults such as the Herat fault, right? This one that runs along the northern part of Afghanistan. Um, my feeling is actually I mean, the, the thing is I I, I I don't I don't know for sure. Um, I, I I've long been interested in in looking at it a little bit more detail about how all of this kind of interacts with the stuff in in Afghanistan. And the stuff that happens in Iran. My feeling is though that it's actually quite, somewhat quite disconnected. You seem to have quite a hard boundary in terms of the uh, north-south shearing that you experience through um, eastern Iran, pretty much at the border of Iran. Right? You can see it. The, the mountain ranges of eastern Iran just kind of end. These big north-south faults seem to end. And there are a couple of GPS um, sites. You see this one here in Zabol pretty much on the border with Afghanistan, and they're pretty much showing zero motion relative to uh, Eurasia, uh, stable Eurasia to the north. And so my feeling is that whatever's happening in the Herat faults and further across in Afghanistan is actually probably more likely to be a distant effect of the, um, of, well, India-Eurasia collision, um, potentially also the large topographic contrast, the, the, you know, the broad doming of the Hindu Kush, et cetera. There's a lot of things that are going on further to the east, and I think that the Herat fault motion is more likely to be driven by those things rather than being connected to the Arabia Eurasia collision. Right? That's my feeling. I'm not totally sure, though. Thanks, Richard. So, Zolmas, if you have a follow-up question, just feel free to un unmute. Because there are no other questions so far in the chat. So that was it. It's a great mystery for me. So I'm always interested in learning more about, you know, what's happening around this area and how we can connect all these different pieces of puzzles to one another. So, yeah. No, but thanks, Richard. No, I'm, I'm completely with you on that one, Soma. I think there's, there's actually, I think there is a lot to, you know, when you when you really start looking into the imagery in that zone between Northeast Iran and Afghanistan, there's, there's a lot going on. And, and I think often, I hope I wasn't too lazy in saying that in this talk that, you know, we, we kind of see that everything goes to zero almost once you get to Afghanistan. And it, in one respect, it does. The, you know, the Arabia Eurasia motion pretty much goes to zero, right? So that's kind of correct. But in terms of activity and active faults and earthquake um, occurrence, it doesn't go to zero. Uh, so in Herat, there are, you know, there's historical earthquakes in Herat. You see all of these nice faults, the Herat fault. There are other faults around as well that a very um, clear expression. So there's a lot going on there. Um, and yeah, what's actually driving it is, um, you know, what's, what's responsible for it is, uh, is a little bit more of a mystery. Richard, I might have a question actually, when it comes to these, um, um, these climatic events that control landscape deformation. Um, you said what you, what you see in Iran, Turkmenistan seems to make sense given the preliminary data. Um, how big of a region do you think you can attack with this approach? Would that also <laughs> help better understand what's going on further east, where people also have correlated terraces? Or um, what's your take on that? That's a good question, isn't it? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how far you can take, uh, you know, a quaternary stratigraphy like that or like quaternary stratigraphy and, and, and have it still, um, you know, a, a, a apply. Um, I've been focusing very much on a lot of our past results are from northeast Iran. 
uh, or from eastern Iran. And, and, and we, I think we see a broad correlation between what I was showing there in Turkmenistan with, with the fragments of information that we have from, from the Iranian studies, right? So, so in some ways I've been driven from trying to build a better, a better knowledge of what's happening in the Iranian interior. Right? And, and, and I think that seems to work. Uh, I'm quite confident that it seems to be working for that area. What happens as you go further into the interior of Asia? So if you go further to the east or north, I don't know if you can, because there's a very different climate. You know, the, the climate in northeast Iran seems to be very much driven by um, it's a Mediterranean climate. Essentially, it's dry, it's arid, right? But you get winter rain uh, coming from, from these big storms that are coming in from the Mediterranean. They recharge from places like the Caspian Sea and from some of the internal lake basins, and they drop that, that rain on, onto those areas. Once you're across to um, you know, the Tian Shan, um, it's, it's different, right? You're, you've got a very different climatic system that's occurring. So I don't know whether you can, you, how far you would be able to make that correlation across. Likewise, if you go southwards in Iran, you're getting into areas that may well have experienced um, monsoonal conditions in the past, right? And so, again, you've probably got very different drivers for that area as well. Great, thanks. Yeah, I might try to remember this question for Catherine, if she perhaps repeats her talk on the uh, late, late exactly, November. Yeah, yeah. She, she might have for Catherine. insight on that. <laughs> cool, yeah. thank you. The, okay, thank you, thank you. Are there further questions, comments? All right, doesn't seem to be the case. Okay, so um, if everything goes back to normal, we'll meet again in about two months. But of course, we hope that uh, we're gonna have Catherine by the uh, by the end of uh, November to give the talk that we missed today. Yep. Um, I'll put the video of this talk online on YouTube as always. So if you check our uh, website, Quake Central Asia, um, you'll find the YouTube link, and of course, also put that on Twitter. Okay, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, Richard, for the great talk. Um, no stay safe and see you soon. Okay. Bye, thanks, Christoph. Thanks, Richard. Oh, thank you so much. See you. Bye. Yeah.